Hi, everybody. Welcome to our learning and development series around coaching. I'm Lisa Hufford, founder and CEO of Simplicity Consulting, and I am thrilled today to welcome our expert, Patty Bergen. Patty wears many hats. She is the CEO of Seattle Coach, and since 2008, when she founded the company, they've certified over 500 coaches and they're still going strong. Mm -hmm. She's a mentor of coaches, she's a facilitator, and uh, she's also an author of several books. One of them is this one, which is fantastic. I encourage you to get it, The Essential Coaching Leader. And she'll also talk about her Coaching for Leaders program that she's running at Microsoft, Amazon, and many other big companies. So we couldn't be more excited to have an expert here to talk about really what it does it mean to create a culture of coachability for managers and for employees and consultants. So welcome, Patty. Well, thank you, Lisa. I've been looking forward to this. It's great. Yeah. So, you know, with the pandemic, we all know that we have all been required to really build resilience in a whole new way and really roll with those punches, adapt to change to really keep our sanity, our mental health and keep everything going. So, you know, one of the first things I thought about as we're going through the pandemic was really having you as an expert in coaching and what coaching skills can really enable all of us, whether you're a manager, an employee, or a consultant out there, to really just create a much more uh, kind of an inclusive, holistic environment where we can all do our best work, get ahead, manage mental health. There's so many benefits when we think about coachability. So yeah. I'd love to start there. We're going to have a conversation today for people to listen in. And I, we have some questions that I'm just going to walk through, and we're going to make this very conversational. So Let's start with that word, coachability, Patty. What does that word mean? Coachability. I think of it as having two axes. One is uh, openness to personal insight, and the other is willingness to experiment. You know, and sometimes people come to me and they say, "I'm a little bit stuck," and I say to them, "Well, I don't say, well, let's try something." I say. What are you learning? What are you curious about? What are people asking you about? What are you ready to do to learn more about? And that's often where the conversations begin. You know, openness to insight. And uh, and sometimes I have people come show up and they say, "Okay, I've been thinking about I've been thinking about this move for about three months, and it's time." And so off we go. I ask them what they know, what they've been thinking about, what they've become awake to. And then we begin to explore the menu of, of potential, desirable, possible experiments. What are they ready to do? So two entry points to coachability, in my opinion. I, I love how you talk about really, when, when, you, when you say words like openness and getting curious, it makes me think of a growth mindset. You know, oh, big right? time. Carol, Carol Dweck pop, popularized that with her book, Mindset. Yeah. And, and really it's it's recognizing that our, our careers, our lives are ours to own, right? And, and it really is about recognizing, thinking about coachability, being open to different opportunities, different options, and maybe ways we hadn't thought about. Well, that's that. the truth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it used to be, there's a book called The 100 Year Life that I've gotten intrigued with, The 100 Year Life where the author says, you know, it, it used to be that we would grow up, we would go to college, we would get our career, and then we would retire. And that is just not the case anymore. In fact, one of the more recent Gallup surveys says that, that people, mostly people under 40, they're looking for two things in their employment, two things above and beyond anything else. Um, the first thing is a sense of purpose to what they do. Everybody knows that excuse me, that work is where you spend the majority of your adult waking hours. Mm -hmm. So the, those hours need to have some purpose around them, more than just compensation, financial compensation. In fact, probably 30 or 40 years ago, one of the best questions I've ever been asked came to me from a consultant like you, Lisa. He said, um, other than money, how do you like to be compensated? And that question is so alive in today's workforce. Other than money, how do you like to be compensated? So that's the first thing. The second thing people are looking for um, is a manager who is interested in their development. 
Lisa, you and I know that that old saying that people join great companies and leave bad managers. And in today's climate, you know, talent is such an important commodity. Everybody works hard to attract and retain good talent. Um, but what I'm thinking now is coachability is related to retaining good good talent. Good, yeah. Good people under 40, especially and older, we're all looking for a chance to grow. Yeah. Uh, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, socially, we're all looking for a chance to grow and develop and uh, to step into new opportunities as we move through our probably hundred year life. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. And I, I so resonate with what you're saying when we think about, I love how you're redefining the term compensation because I think you, you hit it on the head, especially with the younger generation, they really view their time as yeah maybe even a more valuable kind of currency than money. Of course, we all need money, we gotta pay bills, yeah. but it's, it's compensate. You know, I hear it's simplicity, we talk a lot about the intangibles. So, you know, when we're talking with people, mostly corporate professionals transitioning to consulting who have been making a lot of money, but other areas in their life are not feeling fulfilled. They say, you know, um, I wish I had more flexibility. I wish I had more time. I wish I could just, yeah juggle yeah. all the things and so like what price do you put on that because for many people that might be more important than the big paycheck right so it's big time yeah it's a and i think that might be particularly true right now you know in the summer of 2021 because so many of the people you and i know and love and work with are parents mm -hmm. and um I, I've, I've had more conversations about um how children have have found their way into even a greater sense of prominence in people's time mm -hmm. and energy than ever, which I love. I am not a parent, but I am so in the corner of you guys who are. Yeah. Uh, I think, man, you know, if part of your compensation is being able to raise um, lovely little human beings who will give leadership to our civilization, Yes. The decades to come. I am so in your corner. Yes. I, I look, I, I resonate with that because I have two teenage boys. And I think this year and this past year, more than any year, they really got to see what I do. Right. When you think about the reality. Oh, of work, yeah. They kind of knew what I did. You know, I think for many of us, we go, we used to go to work and our kids would go to school and now we're, we were all home. And so it, it really provided a lot of really interesting conversations around work and what does work mean and of course i love what i do you know i started simplicity in 2006 because of my own desire to really find that flexibility from corporate which is so many women and men too but especially professional working women's story and um and so i you know my whole vision was exactly that to really be able to have the time and the money to be able to yeah. ex help my boys you know kind of see the world and you know now they're teenagers i started when they were very little and so it's been you know it's interesting as i as this, as i i'm with you on observing these trends in the marketplace and you know the pandemic has really accelerated it seems to have accelerated people's timeline so if they were thinking about it, right they're like oh i'm making it right now and uh, and you're probably seeing all the articles i'm seeing on um my news feed every day about you know, here comes the summer of, of people leaving and looking for new opportunities. And there seems to be this cultural desire, this cultural kind of reckoning almost of, yeah, what does work really mean to me? And what do, what do I want to do? You know, how do I want to work, work my way? I mean, that's the name of my book coming out in August, right? Work your way um, in a time where talent does have more options than ever before. And how do companies adapt to really Back, it comes back to this creating a cult culture of coachability, really. It does. It does. And by the way, work your way. It's coming out in August, right? Yes. Yeah. So you gave me a chance to give it a pre-read and it is so cool and it's so timely and there's so much authenticity. So audience members, yes, get that book <laughs> in August. Yes. If you want to be a consultant, it's, it's the how-to. It's everything I know. Kind of like what you wrote here with your book, right? Um, if you really want to know everything you've learned about coaching, um, it really you can really sum, summarize it all in there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the things when we were talking about this idea of have this conversation, Patty, that struck me that I'd love to have you talk more about is, you know, what are you seeing in clients you're working with and how coachability and mental health 
are connected. You know, in my career, you know this. Before I became uh, an executive coach, I was um, I was a middle, I was a marriage and family therapist, and I still have that license because it was hard to get, and it informs much of my coaching and much of my coach training that we do. And so I I, I pay attention to mental health issues, and I don't think there's a, a bright line between great coachability and great mental health. They they are pretty related. And I knew I wanted to be a coach when my favorite clients started coming to me back in 2003. They started, or even 2000, they started coming to me saying, you know what, Patty, I don't have a diagnosis. I'm not anxious or depressed and my relationship is just fine. And so right when I thought they were about to say, so I think you fixed me, I think we're done. Instead they would say, and I'm not ready to stop coming here. And I would say, what would we work on? And I kind of had a hunch what they would say because I was already paying attention to where people wanted to go and not just where they've been. And they would say to me, we would work on my on my contribution, my mm -hmm. satisfaction. I'm halfway through, maybe if I'm lucky, I've got three or four decades left on the pebble and I want them to matter. And over time, those people were my teachers and I became a coach. So this past year, you know, in our Coaching for Leaders program, I went to one company and said, look, you know, we contracted to do Coaching for Leaders in February of 2020 and, and then the world changed. So, it, but we, we launched and by September, you know, every, we were in the thick of it. And I said, is this still worthwhile for you guys? Hmm because you know you're not going to the office you don't see each other you know and here i am um, with my team talking with you about coachability and how to coach and what the skills and behaviors and presence involved in great coaching what those things are do you want to continue and i i still remember this this um leader leaning in my sponsor and she said patty this is life support mm -hmm. We are learning to listen to each other. We are learning to be curious. We are learning in this very know-it-all culture. We are learning to be okay not knowing. Wow. And um, so she, I think she used the word providential. Wow. This feels like um, you, may, you may know the old biblical story of a queen of Persia who was, who was a Hebrew queen. Somehow she became uh, queen of Persia and she was able to step in in a moment of crisis for her people and save them from a genocide. And, one, and her mentor, mentor said to her, I think maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mm. And, you know, she's the hero of the story, mm. Queen Esther. And that kept reverberating through my thinking um, back around September that maybe coaching leaders have come to this kingdom, to this civilization for such a time as this, because we don't, we're, we're listening better, we're more curious. We've all worked with, with leaders who kind of give off this vibe. I know, and you don't. So I'll write this down. We've all worked with that leader. Yes. And uh, people who invest time and effort into becoming coaching leaders say, say way different things. They say, I know a ton of stuff. There's a reason I have this job. There's a reason that Microsoft hired me to do this work. And um, there's stuff I don't know. Yeah. So I so you, you got, I have chills hearing that story and hearing when you said the, the feedback was this is life support, um, especially yeah. what we were going through in, in the fall of last year and to recognize the power of coaching. You know, one of the things way back when, 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 I, when I joined one of your first cohorts as, as yeah. to, to be a part of that, uh, one of my personal ahas was recognizing coaching is, 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 is another skill. There's the advising, kind of the knowing, right? We all have knowing. Yeah. And there's lots of skills. There's lots of hats we all wear as leaders, right? And right. What, it really, what it really crystallized for me was, Coaching is about asking questions and getting curious. This is this is my definition, so you can, you know, jump in here and add to it. But what I took away was 
it's a different skill set and, and it's a valuable skill set. You know, the knowing and the advising also a skill set, but the power of my leadership was recognizing when to use which skill. So yeah, that's when, right. right. When do I be a great coach and ask questions and listen? And sometimes I do need to move into more of the advising as well as some other skills. But, but, but instead of just default always being that way, pausing and recognizing that there are different ways of leading and coaching is a hugely valuable way of leading that will create a great culture and improve mental health. Nice. And it's really important to know the right time when to use that. Would, is that something you see with your with Yes, your leaders? that's really well said. Because I, I know that, you know, the leaders I, I train, I know sometimes they have to give direction. Sometimes they have to mentor or teach or inspire. And you know, I want to make sure that their coaching gear is in good shape when they can, um, you know, when somebody, a, a developing leader comes to them and says, I'm stuck, can you tell me what to do? But you think, this person knows more than they think they know. Right. So I'm not going to just tell them what to do. I'm going to move into coach mode and it'll cost me about 10 extra minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, there might be a big payoff. Right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, the value in helping that person recognize they know the answers and yeah. make personal accountability as a manager, like you can't teach that. You can only help someone for really bringing out the best, right? And people. Yeah. And I think you're totally right. It, does, it can take a little more time and we're all busy. So managers might be like, I don't have time. But the, the long term effects to oh, protect man. And yeah. your culture, right? Or, or yeah. it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, if the Gallup organization is right, that people are looking for a chance to develop in the presence of their leader. Yes. And that is priceless. That's right. And yeah. then we all have the, what I love about your coaching for leaders program, Patty, is you, you know, one of the things you teach, I, I believe is, is this idea of everyone has it within them, right? Everyone has the ability to be a coach and to really create a, an inclusive, environment where everyone feels like they are bringing their best self to work. I mean, I know it's part of your, part of your life mission. Is that right? It truly is. Yeah. And I do think people that go through our program, I, I say, see if you can draw a circle around everything you do. You know, you're, you're directing, you're inspiring, you're mentoring, you're teaching, mm -hmm. your deliverables, put a big blue circle around the whole shebang. I want you to learn the coaching gear. I also want you to learn coaching presence which is calm, non-anxious, grace-filled, if you will, um, presence. So that you, and a, a word, I'm in the mental health realm, a word I'm hearing a lot right now is unhurried. 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 Can you be efficient and effective and uh, do the thing for which you were hired, but can you be unhurried at the right time? It doesn't mean you're not quick but not, you're not rushed. Does, does that, I'm curious, I haven't heard that before. Does that mean when you have a conversation with someone that they really, that you're really listening? I, I'm, I'm reading into this unhurried because sometimes we are so busy. I got a next meeting, so hurry, let's finish this one. I got, for being present in the moment, really mm -hmm. listening, giving mm -hmm. that person your time, in a much more intentional way and 100% focus, not over here doing email, not over here, you know, looking at your phone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is, is that what you mean by unhurried? You and I are doing it right now. I mean, our conversation is moving along at a pretty good clip and covering a lot of ground, but I'm not feeling hurried. No. Right. Yeah. No, not at all. And yeah. that, is, that, is, that is so interesting. And that's one of my ahas I'm taking away right now because I think my pers my experience has been mm -hmm. we're all we just all have a lot on our plates all of us you know so managers sure. employees consultants and mm -hmm. we especially the pandemic and other responsibilities it just kind of i think for many of us might feel like there's this burden and we have to hurry through and so yeah i'm i'm gonna have to i'm gonna noodle on that one a little more even for myself right how can i build more unhurriedness into my life right I know. And we're kind of getting into it. Actually, the next question was, how does a manager create a, cul a culture of coachability? Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it begins with the manager. 
with the manager being willing to be have insight into her or his life and to take steps and then to invite their, uh, their their leadership team. You know, I've been teaching coaching for leaders at Microsoft. This is our fifth round right now. So every time we go through, we have about 40 people, 40 managers or leaders, pretty, pretty high level folks that come through. And then of course, there's this multiplied effect where they then go back to their teams as coaching leaders who understand how to be coachable, how to listen, how to be curious, how to be respectful, how to ask permission, how to acknowledge, um, how to pay attention to their energy and the energy of the people they're talking to. know that stuff. And so then they go back to their teams and uh, frequently they call me and they say, hey, can you come sit in with me with my leadership team? Because I want to be contagious in the best of ways. And um, so I think it starts with our coaching leaders. I love that being contagious. What are some, you talked a little about presence and being unhurried. What are some other tips you might share with a manager of how to really create that culture of coachability? There's specific kind of takeaways or things if, yeah. if managers listening, they might be able to experiment with and do today to create a more inclusive culture. Oh, that's a great question. I, um, uh, as a follow-up to, to some of these leadership meetings where, you know, a coaching leader will go into the to a team uh, meeting and say, "Okay, everybody, I want us to uh, I want us to be better at having each other's back. I want us to be uh, one one leader last week said, I want more we ness mm -hmm. to our team. We ness. So we really, -ness. Need I, yeah, I want I want us to be more cohesive. Cohesive." Well, that what she was saying is that she wanted a coaching culture. Yeah. So then she brought in, um, oh, probably half a dozen of her managers. And we sat down for an hour and, and I asked them questions like, tell me about your best experience with a coach. Maybe it was when you were a kid. Maybe it was with music or sports. Maybe it's been more recently with an executive coach. Tell me about that experience and what it was about your coach that really worked. So we just talked about that for a while. And then I asked them, tell me about a scenario where you have traditionally just given direction. Tell me about a scenario where you think if you made like a 10% shift um, in more of a coaching approach, that it could, it could pay off. So then we talked about a few scenarios and I mean, and then the hour was gone, but they had a chance to hear a little bit of each other's story that helped with the coachability and with the we-ness. Um, and then uh, everybody left with an experiment and that helped. Remember insight uh, experiments, everybody left with an experiment, something they were, something they were going to go try. And then I had them, you know, raise their, their index finger and I said, okay, so point to somebody um, to whom you will report the results of your experiment. So they all pointed to, you know, some face on the screen and we had to kind of clarify because our screens, you know, screens. And, uh, but their accountability wasn't to me, their accountability was to each other. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that, you know, by two weeks from now, they were gonna go tell their person um, what happened with their experiment. I think, I think that that team took some major, not terribly visible, but major shifts into the direction and unhurried shifts into the direction of a more, of greater coachability. Yeah. There, you, you know, what I love about that is those are very simple and powerful techniques mm -hmm. that any manager could just start and right, in creating that culture of accountability among the team really does just enhance that cohesiveness. So that's yeah. a great place to start. But let's talk about the employee side, because, you know, building a culture of coachability is, is really a reciprocal shared kind of uh, approach, right? Because you need both sides. The manager can set the stage yeah. and, and then there's a role for employees and also for consultants who are working on these teams, even in a virtual way. They yeah. can absolutely influence the the culture and the working of a team in a really positive way. So talk a bit, little bit about that employee or per, perhaps even the consultant role and how they can increase their own coachability. 
well, it's got to be voluntary. So, you know, anytime I teach a program, I say to the sponsor, um, sorry, don't make this mandatory. And um, that seems to have, well, it's, that makes it a far more interesting um, workshop to facilitate because the people that are there want to be there. You know, want to get good at this thing. And let me just say that in the, I'll just talk about Microsoft for a minute. You guys at Microsoft, um, the past, for the past uh, it's six years, your whole culture has changed. And I, you know, big kudos to Mr. Nadella, but I think also lots of kudos to the coaching leaders who have been through programs like Coaching for Leaders. Because every time, and this just came out on, um, on June 7th of this year, it's the Coaching for Leaders playbook. So we use this with um, all of our participants. And what I've noticed about the participants in Coaching for Leaders, the fifth round, is that they have come into leadership within more of a coaching culture than the people who came into Coaching for Leaders back in, you know, whatever it was, 2017. So you got, I mean, the, the whole culture is, is shifting in a pretty, pretty wonderful way. And um, so now when I say, okay, don't make this mandatory, make it voluntary, um, even the people who aren't terribly coachable, they're kind of curious. They don't want, they have FOMO. They don't want to, they don't want to miss out on this thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that pool of, of sort of the coaching curious, that is expanding. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing I do. Yeah, I, I love that. And the, you know, what I see too with employees or consultants, when I think about coachability for them, and I really, this is about how, how they can advance in their career. You know, for many people say, I want to ask for more money. I want to raise. And, you know, and, and of course, the, the sage advice is, okay, well, do you have the evidence to prove it? You know, can you make the case, right? Is the market paying what you want? And do you have the proof? But also there's this whole element, you know, soft skills, if you will, which I've observed from the very beginning of working with consultants, if that is the differentiator between the good and the great. When I think about, and, and I think a lot of those kind of soft skills are when I, or really coachability. It's, it's really, yeah, I think you're right. Right, being open, being listening, um, you know, just being curious instead of just kind of like, no, we're never going to do things like that. This is always the way we've done things, right? And thinking about thinking ahead. Um, and so, I'm curious if there's any other tips you, you think about as you coach employees on like how to get ahead. Are there any key coaching skills you see that might really help them enhance their own career development? You know, back when you launched Simplicity, uh, soft skills was probably not a very positive term. Soft skills, you know, I roll. Yeah. And um, that's yeah. not the case anymore. So I almost started replacing soft with uh, essential, essential skills. I like that. Yeah, you've got your, your hard skills. You've got the stuff for which you were hired. Um, but yeah, do you have the other stuff? Do you have the emotional intelligence? Do you have the social intelligence? Is that, are those things growing in just for you? So whether you are a consultant, an employee, or a sponsor, I don't see a ton of difference, you know, in your, mm -hmm. uh, your ability to not only pay attention to your own life, to your own heart, to your own mind, to your own aspirations, to your own answer to other than money, how do you like to be compensated? But also, you know, to stay curious with other people around you about, you know, what their aspirations are. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking to your to your leader, you know, and hoping for more responsibility and maybe more comp financial compensation, um, what do you assume about that person? You know, what is it that's making um, making their work meaningful and um, desirable? What is it that you need to be curious about? Because you don't go, you know, you don't go into a um, like a connect conversation. You don't go into one of those just ready to make your case. If you go in with the coaching mindset, you go in with clarity about, you know, what you're aspiring to and what you want. And maybe you've rehearsed what you're going to say, but you're also going to go in with some curiosity and um, probably some good questions. Mm-hmm. When I promise your leader is gonna gonna find that so refreshing. It, right. What I what I love about what you're saying, and this is such an important point, is 
you know, oftentimes they think we all get caught up in our own in our own story. I mean, that it's our world. Yeah. How much? But I want a certain title. I want so much money. And if we add on to that and break out and also think about the manager, and and you said this, and I and I love this. Is what are you assuming about that person? What are their goals and dreams and aspirations? How can you help them? And how can you ask questions? So you, you so it's great to know what you want and. It's also great to understand what their their point of view is and be curious. That's the coaching right ability because it might inform and enhance your position in a way, totally right, make it stronger, and you can connect to actually get what you want by helping them also achieve what they need. Right. 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 So that's been called servant leadership sometimes. Yep. But. Uh, and as I hear you kind of reflect back, I think um, I think that's probably part of coachability. It's not only open to insight, open to next step, but being able to be so clear about your own life that you can now be curious about somebody else's life. Oh, I like the way you just said that. So clear about your own life. Now you can be curious about someone else's because you're outside your own head, and now you're you're genuinely curious about. Yeah, like I love that. Okay, that's great. So last question. I can't believe we're already at the end of our minute. Right? We could talk forever. Oh, yeah. um, this has been so insightful. So last question for you, Patty. What's the one question that you ask yourself? Right now, it's how can I be a wise elder? Mm. Yes. How can yeah. I be a wise elder? Yes. No plans to be elderly, but... Um, how can I be a wise elder? Because our civilization needs wise elders. So not only am I interested in that question for me, but for you, for the coaching leaders I train, you know, if if there are, yeah, if there's virtually everybody I, I work with in uh, coach training and development is in line to be a wise elder, which means maybe you're not going to be as interested in you know, the earliest possible retirement date, but you're going to continue to refine your life and be available um, with your curiosity and with your leadership, not just your technical leadership, but your heart and mind and soul leadership uh, to younger leaders. So that's, that's a good, that's a mm -hmm. I love the wise, wise elder. Cause for many of us that have worked for 20, 30, 40 years, we do have so much wisdom. And, and I think yeah. in my conversation with many senior people too, sometimes we undervalue yes. our experiences, right? And yeah. and uh, there's so much satisfaction in recognizing that we are wise elders and really giving back and bringing up that next generation. It's 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 extremely gratifying. I find it gratifying. Oh, and, totally. Right? Totally. Yeah. Well, this has just been an amazing conversation. So many ahas. Thank you, Patty, so much. I know you're very busy. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you that want to learn more about Patty, whether you want to join her coaching programs, hire her for coaching for leaders, she has obviously a huge network of great coaches. Check out seattlecoach.com. Hit the contact us button for her. You'll also see her books out there. And if you're in the market for project work, marketing project work, or you're looking to hire great consultants, of course, Simplicity Consulting, um, we're, we're, the, we're the destination for great talent. So uh, check us out at simplicityci.com. And I just want to thank you again, Patty, um, for taking this time today. And any thank last you. words? Thank you, Lisa. No, I just, I've known you for a long time now and I'm such a fan. So thank you for inviting me into this, into this conversation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, hopefully everyone that was able to watch it walks away and thinks about coachability and really enhancing their own culture in a more coachable way. And through that, we really do create a better working world. So thanks everybody for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.